start by thanking uh, my colleagues here uh, for uh, associating us, for thinking about us, for this event. Uh, for uh, those who don't know Slim, uh, he is a very young school professor, one of the most science professors in the Indian computer science. Um, and uh, I really appreciate that you uh, associate our university and our institute to this uh, event. Uh, it's a real pleasure, uh, a honor, to uh, receive uh, a colleague, a distinguished colleague, for a distinguished lecture. Um, uh, a great specialist of optimization. Um, with the objective of uh, nation, uh, evolution in computation, a uh, lot of stuff. We will, I, I, I'm sure that we will uh, take advantage and we will appreciate this presentation. Uh, I just want to uh, say that uh, in our university we are uh, we really uh, work hard to uh, raise our level, to improve our uh, outcomes, in, uh, especially in computer science. And we are uh, doing quite well. Uh, just we are ranked first in Tunisia in computer science in science and education by subject, and uh, around 500 in the world. So we are working harder and harder, and we will continue working hard with our colleagues. Uh, but I thank you again, and from Tunisia, and from uh, outside, from the international side. Uh, I, I won't talk a lot because you are not here to, uh, to hear me. <laughs> uh, the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you again uh, for being with us. And we will uh, get back to uh, questions later. Thank sure. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Should I use this or, or the other Both. One? Both? Both. This is for okay. streaming and this. All right. Thanks a lot for the uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, okay, let me uh, let me start. Okay, in this uh, talk, I will uh, focus on an area in which I have been working for more than 25 years, which is called evolutionary multi-objective optimization. In case you are not familiar with evolutionary algorithms, I will provide a very short introduction. Also, a very short introduction to multi-objective optimization in general, that is, without the use of evolutionary algorithms. And, uh, and then I will focus on only a few topics, uh, because there are many research areas in this, uh, in this field that remain open in the sense that there are many, many things that are left to be done. So I will focus only on algorithms because this is an area in which I, ha I have been working mainly in, in the last 26 years or so. Scalability, which is a very hot topic right now in, in, uh, in evolution and multi-objective optimization. And also uh, the development of algorithms for expensive objective functions, which is very relevant for real-world applications. There are many uh, applications in which the main concern is the cost. The computational cost of evaluating the objectives is, is very high. But let me get uh, started with the uh, very short introduction to multi-objective optimization. This field refers to a peculiar kind of optimization problems. Traditional global optimization refers to finding the best possible solution in the whole set space. We are aiming for one solution, which is supposed to be the best given some constraints. In the difference is we don't have a single objective. We have two or more, but some of these objectives are conflicting in nature. So this makes the problem very difficult. Uh, for example, I want to design a bridge, and two objectives that come to mind immediately are cost and safety. Any structure has to be safe because people are going to use it, cars are going to pass over the bridge, and we don't want to have any accidents. We don't want the, the bridge to collapse. So safety is an issue. But at the same time, cost is another issue because we want the bridge to be as cheap as possible. These two objectives are conflicting. If I want to increase safety, I have to spend more money. I have to put more concrete, more steel. Even the, the construction itself 
will take longer probably if I want the, the bridge to be safer. So if I want to reduce the cost, I have to sacrifice safety. Because of this, of this conflicting nature, these problems are particularly difficult to solve. Mathematically, they are ill-defined in the sense that there is no single solution that satisfies the problem. There is actually a set of solutions, and we need to identify from the set one or two that are the most satisfactory. Formally, this is the definition of a multi-objective optimization problem. Instead of having a single objective, I have k objectives, where k is greater or equal than 2. And these objectives, as I say, at least some of them are conflicting. So the first issue in multi-objective optimization is we cannot use the traditional definition of optimality. An optimal solution in global optimization is the best possible solution in the sense space. In this case, we don't have a notion of what the best is. So normally what we use is this definition proposed originally by Francis uh, Isidro Edgeworth in 1881, which refers to finding the best possible trade-off solution, that is the best compromise among the objectives. His definition was provided uh, only for two objectives, and in 1896, uh, the Italian economist Wilfredo Pareto generalized this notion to any number of objectives. However, Pareto was not aware of the work done by Edgeworth before him, 15 years before. He published uh, this definition in his book, Kurs Economy, in 1896, and he used a, a word for his definition, it was called ophelimity. Again, it refers to binding the best possible trade-off or the best possible compromise among the objectives. This notion is called the Edgeworth Pareto Optimum, or most people call it only Pareto Optimum. So, in Pareto Optimality, basically what we said is that a vector of decision variables that is feasible is said to be Pareto Optimum if two conditions hold. There is no other feasible solution such that is less equal in every objective and strictly less in at least one. This is assuming all the objectives are to be minimized. This is a reasonable assumption because I even in, in some cases we have problems in which some objectives are to be maximized, others are to be minimized, but we can transform everything into minimization. So the definition, basically what it says is, for me, a solution is Pareto optimal if it's not possible to improve one objective without worsening at least another one. This means that depending on how conflicting the objectives are, I will have a large number of solutions. These solutions will go from one extreme in which one objective is best and the other is worse to the other extreme in which you know, the second objective that was worse is now best, and the first is, is worse. In between, we will have many different trade-offs, representing everything from the extreme values to compromise values that are in between, in which the, the two, three, four objectives are more or less satisfactory. They are not best, any of them, but they represent good compromise. Depending on the application, some user may decide to select one or another. So this is uh, the definition. If basically, if we take these solutions, all these uh, compromise solutions in decision variable space, this is called the Pareto optimal set. Solutions containing this set are normally called non-dominated. And the image of this set, the objective function values that correspond to the Pareto optimal set, is called the Pareto front. So these are uh, standard terms we use in this in this area. Of course, multi-objective optimization is a relatively uh, recent research area. It started in the 1970s, but at that time, evolutionary algorithms were really underdeveloped. So of course, people were not using evolutionary algorithms in the 1970s. So in operations research, people have used a wide variety of algorithms. There are different types of methods for solving different classes of multi-objective optimization problems. For example, just for nonlinear multi-objective optimization, there are about 30 different families of algorithms. 
There are also algorithms for combinatorial multi-objective optimization and for linear multi-objective optimization. I will focus in this talk mainly on nonlinear because that's the most common domain for us, for those who use metaheuristics. And in this case, these techniques, they are very fast, but they have two main limitations. The first has to do with the, the way in which they generate solutions. These algorithms normally generate one solution at a time. So each time you run the algorithm, at the end you, you obtain a single solution. Uh, this is a problem because if you want to generate several elements of the Pareto optimal set, you have to run the algorithm several times, and there is no guarantee that changing the starting point, the final solution will be different. At the end, you may have the exact same solution you found before. The other problem is that they are very sensitive. These algorithms are normally very sensitive to the shape and the continuity of the Pareto front. If the Pareto front is disconnected, for example, many of them don't, don't work. Also, the Pareto front is not convex. So these uh, limitations have to do with the nature of the algorithms. Many of these algorithms require derivatives or they are based on assumptions of linearity or convexity in the Pareto front. So if this doesn't hold, then these algorithms don't work. This motivated the, uh, the use of evolutionary algorithms that actually started in 1985. That was the first attempt to use evolutionary algorithms in this domain. Evolutionary algorithms, in case you're not familiar with them, they are uh, stochastic search techniques. They are meta heuristic which is intended to solve complex optimization and classification problems by simulating the, uh, the whole uh, principle of natural selection, which says that fetus individuals in a population have a higher probability to survive. That doesn't mean that individuals which are not very fit have a zero probability of surviving. Under certain conditions, they may survive, although their probability is, is low. So these algorithms were developed mainly in the 1960s. The three main families of algorithms, genetic algorithms, proposed by John Holland in 1962 in the US, University of Michigan. Evolution strategies introduced by Ingo Rechenberg in, also in the 60s in Germany. And then the, they were further developed by Hans Paul Schwefel in, uh, in the mid 60s. And evolutionary programming proposed originally by Lawrence Fogel, also in the U.S., in San Diego, in, in the uh, mid-60s. These three uh, families of algorithms all rely on the same principle. They are trying to simulate evolution in a computer to solve complex optimization problems. In a generic way today, we call them all evolutionary algorithms. It's, it's difficult to distinguish today a genetic algorithm for, from uh, evolutionary programming, for example. So in general, these algorithms operate in a very simple way. First, we generate a set of individuals, with, that's how we call them. Each individual contains all the decision variables of the problem. And at the very beginning of the series, they are generated randomly. Remember, these are stochastic algorithms, so we rely on the use of random numbers. So. This is the population. We generate 50, 100, 200 solutions. These are our initial individuals. Then for each individual, we compute a fitness value. The fitness value tells me how good a solution is with respect to the others. So for example, if I'm minimizing an, an objective function and one individual encodes a solution that uh, is evaluated as 10 in, in objective function space, and another one contains a solution that evaluates as 20, 10 is less than 20, so the individual that represents 10 is better than the individual that represents 20. So the fitness function allows me to select solutions to decide these are the best, and the best solutions become parents. As parents, they can recombine, so two solutions will produce two offspring or children, and these children will have a small random change in their structure. This is called mutation. And the new individuals, the offspring, normally will replace the previous set of individuals, which are the parents. 
This is the regular uh, way in which an evolutionary algorithm works. There are, of course, variations. And this is repeated several times, a certain number of iterations, but we don't use the word iteration, we use generations because we are simulating evolution. As turns out, these algorithms that seem very simple and that they are very simple to implement, they can solve problems of a high complexity, as we will see later on. So why is that evolutionary algorithms are suitable for uh, multi-objective optimization? There are two main reasons. First, they are population-based. That means they operate on a set of solutions, not on a single solution. Because of that, these algorithms should be able, if properly manipulated, they should be able to generate several elements of the Pareto optimal set in a single execution. This is an advantage with respect to mathematical programming techniques. The other advantage is these algorithms are very general in the sense of searching. They don't require that much information. They don't use derivatives. So they are less sensitive to the shape and the continuity of the Pareto form. This is another important advantage because this generality is very powerful when solving complex problems. Over the years, a wide number of evolutionary algorithms have been proposed for multi-objective optimization. As I mentioned before, this area started in 1985 with this algorithm, Vega, the Vector Evaluated Genetic Algorithm. It was a PhD thesis at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, in the U.S., by John David Schaefer. And this algorithm was used for a machine learning problem. It was a classification problem. It's a very naive algorithm. It's not Pareto-based. That means its selection mechanism doesn't use Pareto optimality. Actually, this paper, uh, the original paper of Vega, is very interesting because Schaefer cites the book of Pareto, but he doesn't use Pareto optimality in his implementation. There were other algorithms at that time. This is between 1985 and the uh, early 90s. Uh, for example, lexicographic ordering or linear aggregating functions. These were very naive approaches. Linear aggregating functions is just adding up all the objectives into a single scalar value. And evolutionary algorithms deal with the scalar value. So you are transforming a vector optimization problem into a scalar optimization problem. Once the transformation is done, you can use regularly with a fitness function value the evolutionary algorithm. And there are many others, like the epsilon constraint method, which is a transformation method, and the target vector approaches, which are nonlinear uh, aggregating functions, in which we try to minimize differences with respect to target values provided by the user. Target vector approaches have the advantage of being able to generate non-convex portions of a Pareto front, unlike linear aggregating functions. However, in target vector approaches, you need to have the target values, and this may be difficult in some cases. In the, uh, in the 90s, several people developed different algorithms uh, based on an idea proposed by David Goldberg in his book, which some people call pure, pure Pareto ranking. Uh, this was a very simple idea. It's a, a ranking scheme based on uh, Pareto optimality as a way of identifying the best solutions in the population. What Goldberg proposed was that these non-dominant solutions will get the exact same fitness value, so they will be sampled at the same rate, they will have the exact same probability of being selected. And solutions that were dominated, they will get a lower probability of selection by getting a lower fitness. Based on this, at least three main algorithms were developed at that time. MOGA, the multi-objective genetic algorithm developed by uh, Fonseca and Fleming as part of his PhD thesis in 93. Then NSGA, the non-dominated sorting genetic algorithm developed by Kalya Moidev and one of his students in India, which was the first algorithm published in a specialized journal. It was published in the journal Evolutionary Computation in 94. And MPGA, the niche Pareto genetic algorithm, proposed by Jeffrey Horn, who was a PhD student of David Goldberg. He was presented at a conference in the year 94, although the technical report with the algorithm was released in 93. Then, in the late 90s, 
people started to get interested in evolution and multi-objective optimization, a more sophisticated, more elaborate algorithms were developed. So we have, for example, SPEA, the Strength Pareto Evolutionary Algorithm, developed by Eckhart Sitzler under the supervision of Lothar Thiele, who was his uh, advisor at ETA Zurich in Switzerland. This algorithm is actually combines elements of different multi-objective evolutionary algorithms available at that time, but it's not only Pareto-based, but also introduces a concept that had been used in evolutionary algorithms, but not in multi-objective optimization. It's called elitism. Elitism consists in retaining the best solution in the population so that during the search, the behavior of the algorithm is monotonic. That means the maximum fitness never decreases. In multi-objective optimization, elitism is tricky because you have many non-dominant solutions. All of them are equally good. So theoretically, you will have to retain all of them. And this is exactly what Sittler tried to do in his thesis in, in 99. But he realized that by retaining all these solutions, the size of this set that he called the external archive started to grow very quickly. Very quickly, he had not, not only dozens of solutions, but hundreds or even thousands of solutions. And this was a problem because he used these solutions in the selection process. So he realized this was not a good idea. Not retaining everybody was not good. So he proposed a mechanism that selected a subset of all these solutions and kept only this subset. This mechanism was called the density estimator, mm -hmm. and the idea was to keep diversity by removing solutions that are very similar from each other, keeping only solutions that are relatively different in terms of, for example, location in the Pareto front, so that the, the Pareto front was properly distributed. So that was the idea of this algorithm that was uh, published first in IDA in a conference, and the journal version was published in the Transactions on Evolutionary Computation in the year 99. Uh, there, there was a, a second version of SPA published in a conference in 2001, but this version is only fixing a few errors from the previous one. Also, the original SPA uses clustering for the density estimator. SPA2 changes the algorithm. They, they replace the algorithm by another clustering method, which is more powerful. Then uh, it was uh, proposed also by Carl Jamoidev and other students, the NSGA2. The NSGA2 is actually very different from the original NSGA. It was introduced at a conference in the year 2000, but the, uh, the most famous version of this algorithm was published in the transactions on evolution computation in the year 2002. NSGA2 it's a fast algorithm, much faster than the original NSGA. It uses a density estimator called crowding, which is very, uh, very clever because it doesn't require any parameters, although it's not scalable. Uh, the, one of the main uh, keys for the success of NSGA2 is not only that it's a very good algorithm that is uh, very powerful, but also the source code was released in the public domain. So this allowed many people to use the algorithm without having to go through the paper, because normally in, I don't know, in, in, in the field in which you work, but in evolutionary algorithms, it, it normally happens that the pseudocode provided, the description of the algorithm is not complete. Sometimes the authors are missing some details that are important. So when you try to implement the algorithm based on the description of the paper, there are normally details that are missing, and you have to fill these details, and then something may go wrong when, when trying to do that. So releasing the code was very uh, important at that time. There were many other algorithms, like the Pareto Archive Evolution Strategy, the Pareto Envelope Base Search Algorithm, the Microgenetic uh, Algorithm that we proposed for multi-objective optimization in the year 2001, and so on. Most of these algorithms have been forgotten already. Then, the algorithms that most people are using today were proposed between the year 2004 and 2014. So we have, for example, Moia D, which is based on decomposition. I will get into that. Uh, Moia D was uh, proposed in the year 2007. Then, 
we have a, a paradigm called indicator based uh, multi objective evolutionary algorithms. It's a very intriguing idea. I will get into that as well. From there, the most uh, popular algorithm is SMS EMOA, which is a variation of NSGA2, in which instead of crowding, they use an indicator called hyperbole. And then we have NSGA3 that was introduced in the year 2014. Unlike NSGA2, the code was not made available, uh, but there are implementations in the public domain from other authors of NSGA3. And this is an algorithm that uses reference vectors. It's not very different in terms of design to Moia D, but this algorithm is intended for what we call many objective optimization, that is, problems having more than three objects. So, in this talk, as I say, the motivation is to provide some of the hints or ideas that could lead us to more research in this area, given the high volume of publications that we have. We have a massive number of papers on IMO. To give you an idea, I keep a repository, a database, that has almost 13,000 uh, publications so far since 1985. So, it's a high volume of of research, and it becomes increasingly difficult to find topics in which, for example, a PhD student can work. So the idea here is to give some hints on this. So first, I will talk about algorithms, because I already introduced algorithms, and I will quickly describe the three paradigms and the three limitations of these paradigms. First, Pareto base. This is the traditional paradigm. The algorithms developed in the 90s, they were all Pareto based. The idea is selection is based on Pareto optimality, not on fitness. And we have another component called the density estimator. There are several mechanisms for this. Density estimator has the task of maintaining diversity. This is very important because these are stochastic algorithms. So if you run a stochastic algorithm in a computer for a long time, since the random numbers are not really random, they are pseudo-random, eventually every solution will be identical. So this is not good because we are aiming to produce different solutions. So we need a mechanism that blocks this selection and avoids converging to a single solution. That's what the density estimator does. And it's very, very important. The main limitation of Pareto-based algorithms is scalability. They don't scale well because Pareto optimality is a fully orthogonal relation. So as you increase the number of objectives very quickly, everybody will be non-dominated. Actually, the, the number of solutions that are non-dominated grows exponentially on the number of objectives. And this is a problem because we will need a very large population size to deal with this, or we will need a, a, power, a powerful density estimate. However, none of these two solutions are normally satisfactory, and people have done a lot of research on this, on how to extend Pareto-based approaches to many objectives. The second paradigm, the composition base, is actually quite interesting, comes from operations research. The idea here is to transform a multi-objective optimization problem into several single objective optimization problems that I solve simultaneously using the population of the evolutionary algorithm and using something called neighboring cells. By doing this, I can efficiently solve all the single objective optimizations, and I can produce the Pareto front, the Pareto optimal set, very quickly, in a very efficient way. These algorithms are scalable. It's not like Pareto based. They are scalable on the number of objectives, because although I need more weights each time I increase the number of objectives, this increase is linear. It's not exponential as in Pareto based. So I can deal with this although I need a larger population size if I have more objectives. However, the weakness of this family has to do with the scalarizing functions. The scalarizing functions are mathematical expressions that are used to provide the search directions of the single objective optimization. These uh, scalarizing functions are, have been studied a lot in, in operations research, but all of them operate under a similar principle. They assume that the geometrical shape of the Pareto front fits into a simplex. If that is not the case, then the scalarizing functions provide 
misguiding information to the algorithm. So some years ago, in the year 2015, somebody found out about this, and the benchmark problem that people were using at that time, they provided inverted versions of them. By inverting the Pareto forms, the algorithm doesn't work anymore. Of course, this is now a, a topic of research because if you know the Pareto front is inverted, it's easy to solve the problem. But if you don't know what is the real shape of the Pareto front, the question is how could you identify that and use the appropriate scalarizing function? The last paradigm is perhaps the most interesting. In this one, the idea is that instead of using Pareto optimality, I use something else. In this case, it's a performance indicator. Performance indicators are normally used to assess performance, as the name indicates. That is to say, for example, I have algorithm A and algorithm B that are being tested on a set of common problems, and I want to know if algorithm A has a better performance than algorithm B. So these are like metrics. To, to assess performance. So somebody posed the question many years ago, what if there was a performance indicator that was mathematically equivalent to Pareto optimality? For this to be true, the indicator will have to be strictly monotonic with Pareto optimality. It should never get wrong, the, uh, the comparison with respect to Pareto optimality. It turns out that Eckhart Sitzler accidentally, when developing his PhD thesis, proposed a performance indicator that has that property. It's called the hyperbole. However, nobody has been able to find another performance indicator since then. In the last 22 years, nobody has found a different indicator that holds the properties of the hyperbole. The hyperbole is very nice because it has been proved, mathematically proved, that if you always maximize the hypervolume of, of a set of solutions, eventually you will converge to the true Pareto optimal set. In other words, this is equivalent to use Pareto optimality. So far, so good. So why is that not everybody uses the hypervolume? Because it's too costly. Computationally speaking, it's, it's very, very costly. The cost of the hypervolume grows ex grows polynomially on the number of solutions, but exponentially on the number of objectives. And this is a big problem. To give you an idea, SMS MOA, for example, that uses exact hypervolume contributions, for six objectives, a single run may take 20 hours in, in a good process. If you go to seven, it could be three days, because the growth is exponential, it's not linear. So this is an intriguing problem, Many uh, researchers spend several years trying to find more efficient expressions for computing the hypervolume. Uh, particularly in Germany, many colleagues in Germany tried to do this for at least 10 years, and nobody was able to find. Today, most people believe it's not possible to find a more efficient expression for the hypervolume, at least not in high dimensionality. There are versions that are very efficient, sorry, for low dimensionality, but not in high dimensionality. There are, however, other indicators that are weakly Pareto compliant. That means most of the time they are correct, a few times they are wrong. The result they produce is not compatible with Pareto optimality. In practice, most of these indicators have a good performance, for example, R2. However, most people in this field don't like to use this indicator. So today, uh, many of the research that is being done in, in IMO has to do with variations of existing algorithms. There is nothing wrong with that, of course. This is common in most uh, research disciplines. However, the main issue when doing that is that this may prevent people from proposing new ideas, ideas that are really novel in the sense of being able to open a new research line. And this is becoming increasingly difficult to publish, not only to do, but to publish, because there is a whole methodology to publish on IMO that requires a validation with a certain number of test problems, with a certain number of performance indicators, and people are not focusing enough on the idea. They are focusing more on the methodology, which is very bad, of course, for, for the field. 
So some ideas that have to do with having uh, a more disruptive research. For example, uh, some years ago I had a, a master's student in Mexico who uh, came from Cuba. And this guy came from a group that was working on machine learning. So he tried very hard to convince me to do machine learning. He wanted me to be his supervisor, but he wanted me to do evolutionary algorithms for machine learning. And he tried and tried, and, and he failed. He could not convince me, and I convinced him to do it. That was uh, also difficult, but I managed to convince him. And we started to work, and he came out with a very strange proposal that actually took me a long time to, to sort of understand what he did. He found a way of transforming an arbitrary nonlinear multi-objective optimization problem into a linear assignment problem. This was very intriguing. If you know about algorithms, you know that linear assignment problems can be solved in polynomial time. So this is good. Right? It's n, n to the third, but it's good because it's not exponential time. And there are efficient algorithms for this. He used uh, Kuhn Munkers, the Hungarian algorithm for solving the linear assignment problem. This was very intriguing at that time. Uh, this was like the year 2014 or 15, when he came up with this idea. Because the resulting algorithm, although it uses weights to define uh, search directions, similar to the composition algorithms, it was not really part of any of the three main families of algorithms I mentioned before. It's not indicator-based, it's not decomposition-based, it's not Pareto-based. It, it, it looked like a new family. Today, we know that it's very similar to the one of the indicator-based algorithms based on R2 in terms of the way in which operates, although the transformation, of course, makes the algorithm different. But it was very intriguing. It was very difficult to publish this, this paper in a journal because there was a lot of skepticism and also some people didn't like the fact that we were proposing a new idea rather than saying this is an algorithm that is better than the other algorithm. This is just a different way of doing the same that other algorithms are doing. And it was not bad. It had a very good performance and we had lots of uh, incidents in the, in the process lots of uh, stories, like a guy, there was a guy who insisted that we compare our algorithm with respect to his algorithm, which was an obscure algorithm that nobody knew, and it was uh, available, the code was available in Python, so we got the code, our algorithm was in C, it was complicated to, to do the conversion, but we managed to do it, we compared, and we were a lot better than, than, than this other algorithm, and the reviewer got very upset because we outperformed him and he proposed to reject the paper just because we were better than him. He said we were cheating, but we offered him the code and didn't want to use it. But his algorithm was not that good. So sometimes some people get very sensitive about these things. Other ideas are, for example, to understand things like scalarizing functions. Scalarizing functions are very important, both for some indicator-based algorithms and for decomposition-based algorithms. And we don't understand much about the scalarizing functions, how they work, uh, how could we provide extensions of the scalarizing functions. This is a very interesting topic. There are other ideas, of course. Uh, a good friend of mine, Patrick Reed, who is at Cornell University in the U.S., he, uh, he proposed when he was in Penn State this algorithm called Borg. It's actually a joke, but this is only for Star Trek fans. If you are not a Star Trek fan, you're not going to get the joke. The Borg was a, an alien civilization in this series, this science fiction series, that invade planets and they will absorb whatever the other civilization had. If they were very strong physically, they will absorb the strength. If they were very smart, they will absorb the uh, intelligence. Whatever they had, the main attributes, this civilization, the Borg, will absorb. So he used this name for this system in which he combines different components of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms and given an arbitrary problem, he tries many combinations using brute force, some sort of a factorial experiment, tries many combinations of these elements to try to decide which is the most suitable combination for that particular problem. 
obviously this requires a lot of computer power. He actually uses a supercomputer for this, but he has been very successful in some real world applications related to water resources, which is his specialty, and has solved very complex problems using, using board. Some people believe this sort of approach will lead to the automated design of ions without human intervention. Another issue is scalability, as I mentioned before, as we increase the number of objectives, problems uh, arise because we have many non-dominated solutions. In the old days, and this is the period from the year 2005 up to, I would say, 2011, people used to deal with the scalability in two main ways. One was using relaxed forms of Pareto dominance. This is possible, this is the mathematically uh, correct way of dealing with the problem. And the other was using a technique from pattern recognition, something called dimensionality reduction. It turns out that if you have many objectives, it's very unlikely that every objective will be in, in uh, opposition to every other objective. Normally there are objectives that are non-conflicting at all. So in, in this work, for example, what Dimo Brokov did back in the year 2006, when he was a PhD student with Schittler, he built graphs showing the conflicts among the objectives, and he identified non-conflicting objectives and removed them. By removing these objectives, then you transform a problem that probably had seven objectives at the beginning into an equivalent one that has only three. You do the optimization with three objectives, and at the very end, you add the four objectives that are non-conflicting. And this is okay because they are non-conflicting, so you can add them later in the, in the search. So some people did this in deterministic and stochastic ways. It was a popular research topic for some years, and then it disappeared. There are other approaches, like the use of machine learning. There is also an algorithm called the two-archive multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. Epsilon dominance has also been, been used for this. There are other techniques for scalability. Now, this area is very interesting because it has been empirically shown that when reaching 10 objectives, then the behavior of many multi-objective evolutionary algorithms is pretty much like a, a random behavior in the sense that even a random search will do better than these traditional algorithms like NSDA2. This is uh, very interesting because it allows you to, to propose any sort of idea to deal with these problems, and it's very likely these will work better than a traditional algorithm, just because traditional algorithms have a very poor performance. However, back in the year 2010, when I got interested in, in, in scalability, for me, the interesting point was why is that a problem becomes more difficult as we increase the number of objectives? Is this a reasonable assumption that the scalability per se is a source of difficulty? It turns out it's not. In 2015, uh, Hisao Ichibuchi published a very interesting paper analyzing some of the sources of difficulty in many objectivity, when we have many objectives. Some of them are very obvious, have to do with the difficulty to generate a good approximation of the Pareto form. Others are not so obvious. For example, how to assess performance. Most of the performance indicators we have for convergence are not scalable. They don't work in high dimensionality. But he stepped into something we had found a few years before with a colleague of mine from my institution, Oliver Schutze, who is a German, applied mathematician. Back in the year 2010, we were developing hybrids between multi-objective evolutionary algorithms and gradient-based techniques. And we stepped into a very strange problem. We realized that sometimes there were problems with few objectives that were very difficult to solve, and others that had many objectives and were easy to solve. And we were intrigued of why. Why, why is that this happened? It, it was obvious to us that the scalability per se didn't make a problem more difficult, not all the time. But the question was, why? Why is that this didn't happen? I won't get into the details because I don't have enough time, but the source of difficulty we found has to do with the intersection of something that is called the descent cones. When you compute the gradient of a function in single objective, 
the gradient gives you the best descent direction. If you have two objectives, each gradient of each objective will give you a descent direction. If you combine those descent directions, this is the cone of descent. The problem we were trying to solve was within the cone, which is the best direction. You know, you can choose any direction inside the cone to descend. But the question is, is there a better direction? This is what we were trying to solve. And we found out that the problems in which scalability was an issue was because the way in which these cones intersect. This was the, the cause. In other words, it has to do with correlation of the objectives. And this was corroborated empirically, because we found this theoretically, was corroborated uh, empirically by Ichibuchi. He was able to identify problems in which the objectives were highly correlated, and although they have many, uh, many objectives, they were uh, very difficult to, uh, very easy to solve, although they, they had a high dimensionality. So this was a, a very interesting finding, but most people didn't like it at that time. There are many other topics in many objective optimization, for example, visualization. How do you visualize a Pareto form in a high dimensionality? Also, performance indicators, density estimators. All these are very relevant topics in this area. Another interesting topic is scalability in decision variable space. What if the problem is not that I have many objectives, but I have many decision variables? How much is many? More than 100. In, in evolutionary elements, more than 100 uh, decision variables introduces a number of issues. So this was studied uh, by some people. We, we did some study many years ago. And we found that after 256 decision variables, most multi-objective evolutionary algorithms have a poor behavior. In 2013, with one of my students, we proposed the first uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm specifically designed for large-scale optimization. Large-scale, as I said, means more than 100 decision variables. This algorithm was able to solve problems with up to 5,000 decision variables, although the goal was 10,000. We never were able to reach 10,000, but we tried. This algorithm is based on something called uh, cooperative coevolution. <coughs> of course, we could have the combination of many decision variables and a large number of objectives. This is an entire new beast because it would be particularly difficult to deal with these problems because the techniques used for large scale are not the same used for many objective optimization. And the mechanisms are not exactly compatible. So putting them together could raise issues, although some people have already tried it. The last topic is expensive objective functions. I would say that the main limitation of evolutionary algorithms in real world applications has to do with that. Some problems have very uh, costly objective functions in terms of computational time. Uh, yesterday, for example, I was mentioning in a talk an application in which we worked many years ago, back in 2004, with people from NASA. They wanted to optimize the change of trajectory of a satellite that was around Europe. Europe is one of the moons of Jupiter. And this satellite was designed for a specific mission. They wanted to get photos from the surface of Europe because at that time NASA believed that Europe had water and they wanted to have evidence that Europe had water. But once the satellite completed the mission, the, uh, the satellite still had some fuel because this was a low thrust technology. And they, they raised the question, will it be possible to optimize the change of trajectory of the satellite so that now it could move into the trajectory of Jupiter and get some photographs from Jupiter, not only from Europe? This, of course, was a delicate mission because if something went wrong in the change of orbit, then the satellite would be out there with no use. But in any case, the, the satellite will have no use after getting uh, the mission completed, which was taking photographs from, from Europe. So they thought it was worth trying, and they modeled this mathematically, the change of orbit. They had all the equations. But the problem was the optimization. The optimization was actually very complicated because the orbit could be very close or very open. We had to bound how open it could be 
so that the number of decision variables was not too large. Still, we ended up with about 13,000 decision variables. And this was a mixed problem because some decision variables were integers, others were real numbers, and others were binary. It was difficult in the sense that each individual has a different length because different trajectories were possible. So that was the part that NASA didn't know how to do in the evolutionary algorithm, but we got the code from them. One of the main issues was evaluating the objective was very, very expensive at that time. This is the year 2004. Just to give you an idea because we have to solve a system of differential equations for each objective. So that took one evaluation of the objective function took about eight minutes at that time. So that meant that a single run of a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm with reasonable parameters would take about one moment. So that was a lot of time. Over the years, people developed techniques to deal with these very expensive objective functions. They go from fitness approximation schemes, which are clever approaches that use some tricks to avoid recombinations and avoid evaluating solutions. This is good enough if you are aiming for a reduction of 20%, 30% of the total number of objective function evaluation. But if the objectives are really, really expensive, then you have to rely on surrogate methods. Surrogate methods, what they do is they construct a, a function that approximates the original objective, but is cheap to evaluate, computationally speaking. The problem with this is they have a large error normally, and also they are limited in dimensionality. Normally, surrogate can work only for low dimensionality, no more than 10, perhaps 15 decision variables. Every certain time, after performing a certain number of evaluations with the surrogate, you have to go back and evaluate the actual objective to try to correct the error of the surrogate. So this has limitations, but it's very popular. Many people use this, particularly in aeronautical engineering, in all these fields in which evaluating the objectives is very expensive. The other alternative, of course, is to use parallelism. If you can afford having a cluster of computers or a supercomputer, then that's, that's the way to go. This, of course, if you have access to a supercomputer, is very, very expensive. Uh, it may be necessary in some cases. Uh, some colleagues of mine back in 2004 asked me about this problem they wanted to solve. They wanted to optimize the design of the wing of an airplane. And they could only afford about 500 objective function evaluations. The reason was that these 500 evaluations in the true objectives would consume six months of supercomputer time, which is very expensive. And when I was at Tulane a long time ago, 30 years ago, in the early 90s, one hour of a supercomputer had a cost of $50,000. Probably now it's lower, but it's normally quite expensive to buy supercomputers. Okay, so I will give you some examples of applications. There are, of course, many applications of EMO. So as you can see, it's actually useful for something. Uh, so this is a paper uh, with some collaborators from China in which a multi-objective evolution and convolutional neural network was proposed for an intrusion detection system. This runs on, a, on Fox computing on the Internet of Things. And it's an interesting approach because uh, this combination of uh, intrusion detection with uh, metaheuristics and machine learning techniques it is becoming, I, I think, very popular. In here, the, the neural network obviously is a classifier that tries to detect intrusions, try to detect which is somebody who is a legitimate user and who is not. And, uh, and they use Moia D, one of the algorithms I mentioned, to evolve the topology of the, of the convolutional neural networks. The two objectives considered are to maximize detection performance, that means to improve the accuracy of intrusion detection and minimize the complexity of the neural network so that it's uh, a better classifier. Uh, another application also of Moia D, also from China, uh, in this paper they propose an extension of Moia D uh, based on reference distance to solve software project portfolio optimization problems. These are problems that normally software companies face when they have a large number of possible projects and a limited budget, and they want to select 
the projects they are going to finance in a particular year, trying to maximize the return or the profit and minimize the losses, of course, under many constraints. So this, this is an application in, in a real world environment. Another application uh, from Tao, they formulated the optimal scheduling of computing resources over a network for a cloud service center. They formulated this as a problem having two objectives, and they solved the problem with a multi-objective genetic algorithm. The, the objectives are traditional for scheduling, minimize maybe fun, and energy consumption, which is now very uh, fashionable because there are big concerns about the environment. So energy consumption is a, it's a big issue. Uh, another application of genetic programming, genetic programming is another uh, variation of the genetic algorithm, and another popular evolutionary algorithm. This is a system for solving financial fraud detection problems in which they maximize two objectives, confidence, which measures the accuracy of, of a particular rule, and support, which is required to establish the coverage of a classification rule. So in here, the idea is to try to identify an operation that is regular from one that is a fraud. And this was interesting because although it's a conference paper, they compare this approach based on a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm with several traditional techniques used for fraud detection, going from logistic regression, neural network support vector machines by using network decision trees, other boosts, bugging, <coughs> logit boosts, and so on. And they found that this worked very well. The use of genetic programming worked very well. Actually, uh, some of the uh, companies that have the top fraud detection systems, such as American Express, they use evolutionary algorithms. It's just the, obvious, for obvious reasons, the architecture they use is not public. Right? It's, it's uh, protected. Uh, another application of Mendes, uh, they solve a vehicle routing problem with demand responsive transport. This is a, an interesting uh, application in which uh, passengers can be taken to, to their destination as a shared service uh, in countries in, in which, for example, Uber operates. Uber allows a, a lower price if you are willing to share the ride. For example, you are going from your home to the airport. Uber offers you the choice, like, I can give you a 20%, 30% discount if you accept the driver to stop and pick up another passenger, which is in the same way to the airport. You are going to lose a few minutes, but if you can afford this, I will give you a lower price. So for this, of course, you need to optimize the route if this is a bus, because you are going to be taking not one, but several passengers. So in this model, they had seven objectives, and, uh, and they used dimensionality reduction to transform this into a low dimensionality problem with few objectives. And, uh, and as, far, as far as I remember, they produced very good results for, for this problem. So to conclude, uh, in this area, of course, there are still many challenges uh, ahead. I will mention a few in, in the last few slides. Uh, in spite of the large volume of research that we have, as Einstein used to say, as in any other area of knowledge, imagination is more important than knowledge. However, in Nemo in particular, I have to say that for your imagination to be effective, you need to have some knowledge. Because if you don't know anything about Nemo, it's going to be difficult that your imagination produces something useful. So there are several topics worth exploring. For example, density estimators or how to measure diversity in a very high dimensional space. This is actually a very interesting problem not only for us, also geometrically is, is an interesting uh, topic. There are indicators like S energy that have been used recently for this, but there is still plenty to do. Also, mechanisms and operators intended for a specific problem. For example, the one I mentioned with NASA had a variable length encodings because the string encoding the decision variables were not all of the same size. So when you have a problem like that, you need a special operators. So we need to study more of these, these problems in the future. Also, other topics such as coevolution. Coevolution exists in nature. It refers to the dependence of two populations. One population relies on the second one, and the second relies on the first. There is a, a dependence for survival. 
also the hybrids between uh, evolutionary algorithms and mathematical programming techniques, I believe, is an important area. Right now, not many people are working on this. It's one of these topics that comes and goes, but I, I think in a few more years, people will revisit this topic. So it's important if you get interested in this area, even if you are not familiar with evolutionary algorithms, anybody can get into IMO. You can always bring ideas that will be useful to us. In the past, we benefited, for example, from people who came with a baggage in data structures and proposed things like red black trees or quad trees. Also, concepts on computational geometry like convex holes have been used in external archives in multi objective or Voronoi maps. They have been used as density estimators. Uh, even concepts from economics like game theory have been used for designing new multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. There is one algorithm called the Nash genetic algorithm that tries to approximate the uh, Nash uh, point for conflicting objects. So it's, it's, very, uh, it's a very interesting topic. I know it's highly specialized, but there are applications in almost every domain you can imagine of IMO. It's intended, as I said, for very difficult optimization problems, not for simple problems, only for very difficult ones. And, uh, and we hope to attract people who can bring new ideas to be more disruptive in this field. In case you want to know more, you are welcome to visit the IMO repository. It's a website that contains a very large number of papers. Also, we have public domain implementations of many algorithms, including full platforms like plat IMO that contains more than 100 algorithms in MATLAB. We have code in C, in Python, in Java, in, uh, in C++, <coughs> in MATLAB, in several programming languages. And it, all the software is free to use. You can download it and, and use it. And uh, that's all from my side. Thanks a lot. Open for any questions. for us, the, the future is to solve problems that we cannot solve right now. Uh, one of them is, for example, in uh, drug design. Drug design 
these are normally inverted problems. Once uh, they find a particular drug for a disease, it's a molecule. And doctors know that in the neighborhood of this particular molecule, there is another one very similar for a related disease. And, and they try to, to use optimizers to find it. But it's very difficult because the search space is huge, simulations are very, very expensive. So this is a domain in which meta heuristics have not been able to produce anything good in the last 20 years. So we are waiting for more computer power <laughs> to get there or, or other techniques that allow us to, to get there. And like that, there are many other uh, domains. Uh, I mentioned, I think it was yesterday in another talk, I have a colleague in my institution who works in analytical chemistry, and they use mathematical models of molecules. But these models are very, very expensive to compute because they are based on, on some well-known uh, theories of physics. And just to give you an idea, a very simple molecule, the, the traditional model requires for computing, I think, the energy of the molecule, they have to compute about one trillion integrals of merit. One trillion is not one million. One trillion. <laughs> and this is for very simple molecules. Some mathematician some years ago, he got the Nobel Prize for this, he developed a numerical method to reduce the, the computational cost in, in, in a very significant way. But still, solving these problems takes months, even for simple molecules. They have tried everything, their neural network, they have tried evolutionary aliens, everything you can imagine and remains pretty much intractable. Nobody has been able to produce anything reasonable for molecules beyond the simplest one. So for us in optimization, this is the last one. <laughs> this is the dream. We want to get to these intractable you problems in the next 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because uh, I would like just to mention that we have mathematicians Ah, okay. Yes. Excellent. People from nanotechnologies, the space, uh, computer science, artificial intelligence, uh, optimizers, um, logistics, uh, really, <laughs> Very diverse all, all application uh, fields uh -huh. of computer science here. Thank you, Professor Quadro, for your presentation. I really appreciate every part of it. I wanted to ask you about the uh, every algorithm related to particles, like particle optimization or net space optimization. How do you think can we include the evolution part in this kind of uh, algorithm? Like, for example, how do we evolve the particles or the ants uh, okay. in generation to make it, uh, like, for example, when we apply the particle swarm, uh, swarm optimization and transform it into a multi objective particle swarm optimization, like the one you presented here in MATLAB? Uh, how can we evolve the particles or the, the end, for example, the end uh, algorithm in order to make it an evolutionary multi objective uh, optimization? Thank you. Okay. That's a, another <laughs> question. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, we worked on, on multi objective PSO some years ago. PSO, strictly speaking, is not an evolutionary argument because it's not fitness based, but you can still evolve it. The, the issue with PSO is if you use the traditional PSO, mathematically, you cannot guarantee convergence because what it does is uh, it's just adding vectors. So you can only guarantee convergence to the best particle in this one. So you need to add mutation. Without mutation, convergence is not guaranteed. And PSO has a very strange behavior sometimes. In, in particular, in single objective. Multi objective is not that strange. Single objective is this is the only algorithm I have seen that is able to reach the optimum and keep optimizing. <laughs> they keep going. <laughs> they don't even stop in the optimum. So, but that's because of that. Uh, there is a variation that was proposed in the 90s, a variation of the equation for adding uh, the personal bears and global bears that introduces an element that is meant to guarantee convergence instead of mutation. So you could use that version, or you could just simply add mutation. It's just if you add mutation, you could add mutation in the velocity, or you could add mutation directly on the particle. 
So it, it's the question. Most people do it in velocity because it's sort of the PSO way. They call it turbulence. They don't call it rotation. But if you want to do it more like an evolutionary ion, it has to be directly on the particle because that's the decision variable. Right? Velocity is just something you compute to change the direction of the particle. Can you use like multiple generation? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's the same. Yeah, you, you, you use an external archive. You use Pareto based uh, selection. Everything else is the same. It's just you don't have crossover. And theoretically, you don't have mutation either. The only thing you have to be careful in, in multiple objective PSO is the speed limit. If you use the original PSO, you can go beyond the, the limits of the velocity, and then it, it will collapse. Actually, this was a very intriguing problem. When we developed the first MOXO back in the year 94, I think it was, we, we had, no, it was 2002. 2002, we proposed a MOXO that had a good behavior, but at that time, people like Kennedy, one of the creators of PSO, he proposed a MOXO, and there were others, and all the others collapsed. In some problems, they converged to a single solution, and nobody knew why. There were only one or two mobsos that didn't have that behavior. And in 2009, we found out the reason was the velocity. Most of the mobsos went outside the, uh, the bounds of the velocity. But there is uh, also an equation that was proposed by Kennedy in, in a paper from 2004 that you can bound the velocity. And once you control the velocity, PSO works relatively well. It's a very good optimizer. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Thank you. My question is, uh, there are many uh, algorithms for uh, multi objective optimization, of course. Uh, is there uh, another, an algorithm that takes an input such algorithm and produces an output the similarities between set of input algorithms? Ah. <laughs> no, no. That's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, many people ask similar questions in the sense that what you would like to know is, is this the best choice for this particular problem, right? Is, is this algorithm will be the best choice, or given a set of algorithms, which will be the best choice? The closest thing we have, there are some platforms like iRace that are based on the statistics. What they do is you enter the algorithm, and this tool will find the optimum parameter for a particular problem instance, for this algorithm. But for doing what you are saying, you will have to introduce one by one the algorithms and see which is the best performance they can achieve with this optimum parameter. So this platform gives you the optimum parameters of one algorithm for one problem instance. So you can use several, and then you can decide, OK, for this particular problem, this is the best. It's very costly, of course. You need to perform lots of runs, so you need at least to have a cluster of computers. About the, the first one, the combination, normally what we try to do is to keep the population of the evolutionary atom, because this is the main advantage, and use, for example, a gradient-based method to focalize the cells. Obviously, you are sacrificing generality of the algorithm, but by using the population combined with the gradient, you get a, a very powerful optimizer. Better than the mathematical priming technique, perhaps not as good as the evolutionary algorithm, but you can prove things, like convergence, for example, you can prove in this hybrid. This is what we did back in 2010. 
uh, some people, my colleague Oliver Schutze, he completely abandoned evolutionary albums, and, and he is now working more on enhancing traditional mathematical programming techniques. For example, he, he proposed a variation of Newton's method for multi-objective optimization. As you know, Newton's method is a second-order method. It's very aggressive, but very limited because you need the second derivative. So he proposed a variation that uh, is very powerful when you can use it. It converges in very few iterations and is intended for particular classes of, of problems. But the combination is normally like that. It is you take the advantage of one, which in this case is the population, sacrifice generality, and use the gradient as a way to compensate the, uh, the lack of generality by saying, okay, in the problems in which this works, my algorithm is going to be very efficient, and I can prove things about the algorithm. So that's the main advantage we saw. About uh, DEA, yeah, I have seen some words in multi-objective. It's not very popular in, uh, in this field because most people who work on IMO are not familiar with these techniques from uh, operations research. Uh, I have seen most of this work in the European Journal of Operational Research. They have published. There is actually one that is a hybrid using evolutionary algorithms and, and, and DEA. But uh, many people have tried this. It, it's just they use these techniques as for a different task, more for uh, decision making, not really for optimization. We use it more for selecting from all the Pareto front which are the solutions preferred by the user. For example, uh, Roman Slovinsky, he, he developed an approach called NEMO, fish in the movie. Uh, this NEMO uses NSEA2 combined with the Choquette integral to try to incorporate preferences from the user during the search so that instead of generating the whole Pareto front, only a portion is generated. So those hybrids, I think, are very interesting, but most people from evolutionary elements are not interested in them. The interest is normally in operations. So it's, it's very strange. The two communities are not very close to each other, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for having us along with Professor Carlos to your nice institution. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Joshi Solvac for all uh, this uh, nice environment. Uh, indeed, I would like to open some uh, perspectives and framework for multi objective machine learning. I know that many students today in Tunisia are interested with data science and uh, especially with machine learning. Indeed, I um, discovered after my habilitation thesis the field of evolutionary machine learning, which is a combination between evolutionary computation and machine learning. Indeed, most machine learning uh, induction algorithms are greedy. This means that they found the classification model that falls into a local optimum. This is why researchers from the United Kingdom and many other countries proposes the use of evolutionary algorithms to induce decision trees, neural networks, LVMs, and so on, by optimizing the set of hyperparameters. And this gave many interesting results. And today, with the evolution of the IoT domain and so on, we are looking for a classifier with minimal complexity to be able to uh, install this classifier in our devices, okay, our smart devices, and to have the maximum performance. And these two are two conflicting objectives. So today we use multi-objective evolutionary algorithms presented by Professor Carlos, not only for classifier uh, induction, but also for feta selection, and even for deep learning. For example, I supervised the PhD thesis for the optimization of convolutional neural networks because we need to optimize the architecture and also, we would like to compress the model. So, how to find good state connection, how to minimize the number of ways, how to activate or deactivate uh, nodes or connection between nodes, there are many channels. So, we could see that the optimization of convolutional neural networks could be seen as an optimization problem instead of or a graph problem 
okay? And many objectives need to be optimized. And this is why today I uh, migrated a little bit from evolutionary multi-object optimization to evolutionary machine learning, but I'm still uh, working uh, and also working with Professor Carlos on this topic, which is very interesting. And if uh, there are students that are interested in evolutionary machine learning, they can contact me, and I would be happy to provide you with many interesting documentation, okay? And uh, I, I should note that uh, the IMO field is true that it has 37 years of history, but there are many other challenges that could be uh, investigated in the future because uh, of many trends, and even for the machine learning trends, we have machine learning for evolutionary computation, and vice versa, we have evolutionary computation for machine learning. And thank you very much. in objective function space. In decision variable space is an unsolved problem. Nobody has been able to reach 10,000 decisions. Ah, sorry. In those cases, you stop the algorithm, show the user some solutions, and then the, the user decides which are the solutions preferred. If you know more about the problem, then you can do this before the search. You can decide this is the search direction in which I, I want to continue. Evolutionary algorithms are normally considered a posteriori approach. So you do the optimization, and once you generate the solution, you show all the solutions to the user. But this is normally not the case in the, in the real world. In the real world, you have to do it interactively because otherwise you will have too many solutions. But in many real-world applications I have seen, it's not much of an, an issue because the algorithm generates very few solutions. For example, I saw one some years ago, some guy in Europe, they, he was optimizing the design of a prison. And it was very expensive to, to evaluate the objectives, so they produced only about seven solutions. And they showed the seven solutions to the user, the user will say, okay, these two are the ones I prefer, and they magnify the search in the area of these two solutions. So they produce more around the two. That's the way normally it's, it's done, and there are algorithms for, for doing that. For the second, for uncertainty, there is a lot of work. Uh, we don't normally consider uncertainties everywhere, but at the same time, but people have dealt, for example, with uncertainties in the objectives or uncertainties in the decision variables. I don't remember anything in which the whole system has uncertainties, which is, of course, a possibility. But uh, most people, some years ago, they decided to use, for example, 
fossil logic. Some of them use Bayesian optimization for dealing with the uncertainties. There are different techniques that people have used. It is not a very popular topic within EMU. Most of this work has been done on fossil logic. The fossil logic guys, they also have multi criteria decision making. And sometimes they, they do optimization, so they have developed a number of techniques in there. But there are people who, motivated by their application, they have proposed some uncertainty handling methods within a multi objective evolutionary. So there is war there. We don't always assume everything is separate. <laughs> I, think, I think we are done with questions. I, I will share with you a thought because I have the pleasure to receive today some, several friends and, and colleagues for the first time oh. or for the first time since a long time. Okay. So I need to invite you more often. <laughs> I have the pleasure to see them here uh, and, and uh, to see such number of colleagues. Okay. Uh, I just uh, want to say uh, also to the audience that uh, next week we have uh, another series of uh, seminars with uh, data visualization, so stay tuned, and uh, you are welcome again to, uh, uh, to share with us these seminars. Uh, last word, I, I really want to thank you very, very much for this special and distinguished uh, lecture talk. Uh, I would like to give you some souvenir from the institute. So, uh, uh, colleagues of mine and myself would be jealous because this is the unique ah. <laughs> specimen of uh, this uh, kind of trophy made specially for, for you for this event. Oh, so thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grab the picture together. <laughs>